um, and the record is on. Um, we will start uh, with Diane. Diane, uh, when you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Great, thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited about this discussion, um, largely to hear my, my panelists and, and to participate in the discussion um, today. So I'm thrilled to be here. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about our national open court data standards and talk about some of you know what the purpose is, what's going well, what's not going so well, um, and, and uh, as, as access to, to justice data. Um, so the first question is what problems are the national open court data standards trying to solve? Why are we trying to implement these these data standards. We've got a lot of challenges with court data. Um, we've got across the United States increasing demands for court data, a lot of requests for data, um, but also a lot of misuse and misinterpretation of court data um, because we make it hard to understand. You know, I get a lot of complaints that people request our data, they want our data, or they use our data, but then they're misusing our data. And my response is because we make it too hard. Um, so that's part of what NODS, National Open Court Data Standards, is intended to, to address. Um, the uh, this this challenge comes from from the whole basically the structure of the United States government, you know, with with the question of federalism. Um, most court cases in the United States are filed in state courts, not in federal courts. So over 95% of court cases in the United States are filed in state courts. That was 61 million cases in 2020. And 2020 was a light year because of the pandemic. Um, but every state has its own laws and court rules around accessibility of data. So anybody wanting to do a project where they're, they're looking at justice data across the United States has to look at every single state independently. They have their own laws and their own court rules. And then within states, in some states, every court has its own rules around accessibility of data. And so it makes it very, very challenging to be able to use the data. Um, and the, the data availability goes along a spectrum. In, in some courts, in some states, there's basically no information that's automatically available. Everything has to be a formal request, sometimes a payment. Um, there can be a lot, of, a lot of challenges to access the data. In some states, basically everything is pub public record. Everything is available to, to all requesters um, with, some, with some limitations. If it's, if it's um, data that has to do with children, often it's not available other sensitive areas is, but there's just, you know, just to give an example, um, you know, in Massachusetts, almost nothing is automatically available in other states, for example, in, in, um, in Arkansas, where I live in Florida, basically anything people ask for is, a, is available, is available to the public. So beyond different, different policies about access to data, every state has its own terminology and definitions because everything that happens in the state court is based on state law. Um, and then again, in some states, every court has its own terminology and definitions. So when you're talking about something, even something as simple as a closed case, courts can have different definitions of what they mean when they say closed case. In some courts, it means that that case has been, has been adjudicated and disposed in, in others, um, it, it means that they have completed the entire process, including appeals or any other post adjudication activity. So there's a lot of variety in that. So why data standards? Our goal is to, to make case level data more available. So to all the many users of court data with the fundamental purpose to try to improve public policy and reduce the possibility of error and misinterpretation. We wanna provide greater transparency. I know that's something this group takes very seriously, um, but to improve public confidence, public trust in the, in the judicial system. And we wanna reduce the burden on court system staff to respond to the very many data requests that they get. Um, so when we're talking about standards, we're talking about the rules by which data are described and recorded. The scope of the NODS project is the data maintained by courts for business purposes. So it's not asking courts to collect any additional data. It is what is already necessary for business purposes. To be clear though, the standards are voluntary. They are aspirational. No court is already collecting all of the data elements and nods, and they're separable. So courts can choose to adopt the national open court data standards in some areas, but they don't have to, to, to um, uh, 
to adopt them in all areas. So what I'm saying by this is that this is very much, we're playing the long game here. This is not something where we can wave a magic wand and there will be court data available across the United States um, anytime, particularly soon. This is a process where we are trying to bring states, bring local courts on um, and encourage them to adopt data standards so that, so that the data are usable. To give you an example of what this looks like, um, the, the, there are over 200 data elements, but we have the different areas um, of, of state courts, civil, family, probate, dependency, which is child abuse and neglect, juvenile, uh, criminal, and traffic. And then for each data element, we have a definition, and then we have sample values of, of um, what we would consider. We don't expect that any court is going to change their state law or change their, their court rules, but, but what we are asking them to do is to look at some of these these data standards and map or translate the terms that they use locally to these national data standards so that it's more understandable and usable. So we provide a leadership guide for this. This is a very high level document um, for, for court leadership to, to you know, talk about what the purpose of NODS is. We provide a user guide where we go much more into, into detail about why and how um, to, to be able to adopt these, these kinds of data elements. Um, and this is in addition to the um, in addition to the uh, to the actual data elements, we're also providing technical standards, and so this is something programmers can use when they're when they're working on databases. I will tell you, this is our biggest challenge. Virtually everybody I talk to says yes, standards are a great idea. This is almost universal. Here, use mine. So that's what every court wants us to do, right? Everybody wants us to have national data standards and we want, then they want us to use their data standards, their data definitions as the standpoint. Obviously it doesn't work that way. Um, we have to have some, some agreement. So the way that, that we did this for our, for um, in the United States is that we brought together subject matter experts in all of the areas that state courts operate in, so civil, criminal, um, probate, traffic, and so on. Um, and we basically locked them in a room to come up with what are, what are the data elements that are used, again, actually used by the courts, they're part of the business process of the courts, but that are commonly requested or, or commonly asked for by, by other organizations or by researchers um, to try to develop that list of, of what, um, what should be included in NODS. It does not include every single data element courts should collect, but those that, again, that would be more likely to be exchanged or requested. So this builds on something that we've done for, for over 40 years, and it's something called the Court Statistics Project. In the Court Statistics Project, um, we collect aggregate data from our state court systems around the country to provide a national view of what's happening in state courts in the United States. Um, the, the website we have for that is courtstatistics.org. I'll also put that in the chat. Um, please go in and, and play with that, and you'll, you'll get to see some of some of what we've been doing for a long time. The big difference is the court statistics project is all about aggregate data. So it's the big picture numbers, whereas NODS is about case level data. So being able to use data for more, um, for more research purposes and public policy purposes. So in doing this, this is again, part of the court statistics project where we talk a lot about data governance, You know, the framework by which courts uh, make decisions about data, they make sure that the business process and the data activities are, are in sync with one another and having strategies around collection, use and, and disposal of data. Um, so we have some principles that we talk a lot to courts about, about, about court data, about treating court data as an asset, keeping data quality be critically important front and center, knowing who's responsible for this, having practical data standards in place, which is part of where NODS fits in having a plan and strategy to identify and solve data problems, to make innovation and learning part of their culture. And then this is really important, having a way to resolve conflicts because everybody has different opinions sometimes on how court data should be collected and how it should be used. 
So I'll give you a few of our resources. Um, the, the NODS website is ncsc.org slash NODS, a longer link there for data governance. Um, and then also um, my, uh, my contact information is there as well. And I think I've used up all my 10 minutes. So I, I look forward to, uh, to having some questions and discussion. Thank you, Diane. Um, I noted uh, some, some key phrases that you made in your presentation, such as playing the long game and how like you are like setting up standards, but at the same time, like making advocacy and managing people, expectations, uh, anxieties also, uh, these like use my standards uh, thing um, to, to play uh, the long run and, and to open up data based on the demand and based on, on what people really need. Um, and this is uh, some of the topics that we usually discuss uh, in these meetings. So thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, speaking about playing the, the long game, um, we will jump to Alvaro's presentation uh, that will talk about the opportunities and challenges of defining a data strategy at the magistrate's court. Um, so at the subnational level, let's say, um, so we are coming from the national and now we are going to, to what happens um, with data strategies in the city of Buenos Aires. So Alvaro, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Florencia. Thank you for the invitation to open data charter. It's really a pleasure to be here and, and learn about your experiences and share mine with, with all of you. Um, my, my expertise is, is not technical in terms of open data, but it's more institutional or political. You know, I'm, I'm more used to designing and implementing open government policies. And in, in, in the last years, I, I'm, I'm working for the uh, Council of Magistrates of Buenos Aires City, where with, uh, I'm part of a team that promotes open justice policies in the justice sector. And I'm also currently the the, the co-coordinator of the International Open Justice Network. That I will share you the links uh, if you want to browse our web page and, 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 and our recent work. So uh, in that context, I will speak more about the political, the political economy of reforms. Uh, and my message in a nutshell to all of you is that, that you need to craft a strategy. You need a strategy to promote open data reforms in, in, in the justice sector. Um, in, in the judicial branch of Buenos Aires City, we have been working on this, on, on this issue for, for the last five years at least. Five years ago, an open justice portal was set up. Uh, currently, you know, if you browse the link that we will share in, in the chat, you can find that we have been able to open batch data. Uh, and also we uh, are responsible for access to public information issues uh, within the council. Our experience so far is that opening data is, is not an easy task. You know, I, I don't wanna uh, bring you bad news, but uh, the, 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 the justice sector and judges, at least in Latin America, are quite uh, reluctant and risk averse uh, when it comes to opening you know the, the 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 justice system so it is very important that you you know design a strategy that can uh, enable you to you know to move forward to to achieve concrete um reforms even if it requires that you that you need to take baby steps you know you don't need to go for big changes of big reforms in you know all of a sudden you you can be able to 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 take baby steps and 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 small achievements can make a huge difference. Um, so the first recommendation is that you you need leadership. You know, in 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 reforming institutional reform, usually we talk about top down models or bottom up models. Top down models in the justice system is that you find a champion of reforms that could be the Ministry of Justice or, you know, a senior member of the highest court in, in your city or, 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 or in your jurisdiction. Um, it is extremely impo important to find someone that embraces these policies and, and that pushes and promotes these policies, especially because of the risk averse attitude that we usually find in, in our justice systems uh, in the region. Another strategy is that 
you design a, a bottom-up strategy. In this, in this case, you need to find judges or members of the judicial branch that are willing to invest in open justice reforms. In the city of Buenos Aires, we, we have, for example, two, uh, two local courts that have designed their own open data policies and they share their, their information through Twitter. They have set up two Twitter accounts and you can access through a drive uh, through the Twitter account to all their open data. That's also you know, a, an interesting uh, model for promoting reforms. The second message is that you need internal supporters. Uh, you need to look out for the data champions or, or for those reform-minded people within the justice system. Um, in, you know, one of the ways to do this, for example, is to set up a, a working group of data liaisons that, uh, I mean, or all the people that uh, who are in charge of data policies in the different sectors of the justice system. Um, in previous experiences, not in the, not in the Judicial Council of Buenos Aires City, but in, 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 in the government of Buenos Aires City, we implemented this strategy and it was highly successful. We started with monthly meetings where we gathered to talk about data, to talk about interesting cases related to the use of data, to discuss problems, problems of security, of quality, of interoperability. And after two or three months, we started, you know, uh, we developed trust within all the actors. And after six months, we started drafting and co-creating data standards that were eventually implemented uh, uh, at the city level. The third message is that, you know, you need to invest in cultural change. You know, open justice and open government is not a common topic uh, within the justice system. Not all the actors, I, I would say almost none of the actors are familiar with this kind of topics. So there's a lot that, you know, at the same time that you promote open data changes or you promote open data uh, reforms, you need to, you know, uh, to, 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 to generate discussions and disseminate uh, uh, what are the advantages of open government. You know, you need to identify key actors that you know that they must be, you know, familiar with, with, with open justice and open government issues. In the case of Buenos Aires City, for example, we invited uh, members of the highest court and members of the Judicial Council to different OCP meetings, you know, the open government partnership meetings, the regional meetings or the, 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 the summit. And that was very helpful because they got familiar with the topics, with the different conversations, and that in a way um, help us to clear the way to, to promote this type of reforms. We also connected open justice to other issues that they, they were already familiar with. For example, with the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. That helped us a lot to, uh, to show them that this was an international agenda, that it was you know, consolidated, that it was relevant, that it was in a way, the, the language that is spoken at all the international events. So that help us. That uh, help us a lot. And even there's a lot of, as I said, resistance to open justice and open government issues. You know, open data in a way is the less countercultural topic within open government, uh, at least for judges. I mean, it's harder to talk about transparency and you know anti-corruption or citizen participation. And in a way, I think that, that the, the digital component of the open data policies, you know, makes it a little bit easier to, 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 to work with and to promote this type of, of reforms. The fourth point is that it's very important to have peer-to-peer -peer transfer of know-how. Uh, if you want to, you know, bring judges and judicial officers to talk about these issues, you know, a, a good strategy is to connect them with judges and judicial officers in other jurisdictions already working, already familiar with this type of, of, of issues. That usually uh, helps uh, to, to, you know, to, how would you say, to lift uh, the, the, the barriers uh, or the cultural barriers that they have. If it's civil society, for example, promoting open data, sometimes they are a little, more, a little bit more reluctant. But when they see a peer from other city, from other country, from other province, that 
uh, helps a lot. And the, 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 the final point is that you can also use other open justice policies as a backup or, or as a way to endorse open data. For example, in most Latin American countries, we, we, know, we have very strong and powerful access to public information law that include uh, active transparency obligations. So, I mean, judiciaries, in theory, have to, you know, are, 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 are obliged to publish, you know, uh, lots of information uh, of information and data. Well, if you use, you know, th those those thresholds of reforms that have been already implemented, like all the achievements in the field of access to public information, and you relate your open data policy to 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 those achievements, it's a way to, you know, to to make it easier to generate these discussions and to and to change the culture, you know, within uh, the the justice system. In in the city of Buenos Aires, my, my final point is we we set up this portal five years ago. We have two courts that are very active in 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 releasing open data. Last year in two thousand. And 21, we got the, the the judicial council to approve an open justice plan. So now it is mandatory for the council to have an open justice plan, which of course one of the key pillars is is open data. So this new open justice plan uh, will invest in the next uh, two years. It will invest in training, in dissemination, in promoting best practices, and in conducting pilot projects. We hope that in that way, we would be able to uh, increase the level of awareness of the advantages of, of open justice reforms, and in particular, uh, open, open data, and start building a, you know, a, commu a community within the justice system that will help us uh, move forward in, in a more uh, rapid way. And um, the last point is uh, at the Open Justice um, International Network, we have a working group on, on open data. I invite you to, to visit our webpage and browse all the work that the group has been doing lately. And in particular, I recommend that you look at our um, map of open justice data portals in Latin America, which is a very useful tool that you can navigate all the different experiences from Latin American judiciaries that have implemented open data portals. Thank you. Thank you, Alvaro. And um, I really appreciate what, what you were mentioning. Um, so you started, or, or um, the strategy started from the supply side by opening a portal where some data sets uh, were published to then like embed more like critical reforms uh, by looking at peer-to-peer -peer learning networks, but also looking at champions that can like make these uh, reforms sustainable. So um, I really appreciate all uh, your learnings and I hope that um, the rest of the of the audience can resonate into, into these um, tips that you, you have given in your presentation. So uh, we will jump now to Elizabeth's presentation. Um, she is from WRI and she will talk about open justice, but more from, um, from the perspective of uh, how can uh, open data help in accessing uh, and, and, and providing information to make um, justice more equitable to all. So Elizabeth, Great. if you're Thank ready. You. Yep, I should be. Let me just get myself organized. Make sure you can all see my screen. There you go. Um, thank you so much for for um, agreeing to let me speak with you all today. Um, I'm going to share some information about the STRIPE project, which stands for Strengthening the Right to Information for People in the, in the Environment. Um, but before I get into it, I thought I would give you a chance to meet directly one of the local community members we work with. Sign it up. Uh, here's a 
So Basan lives in the Mongolia gold mining region of Zamar, and there the herders travel from spring to winter camps raising livestock, which is their primary source of income. In addition, the pasture lands is home to ancient cultural heritage sites that actually date back to the 7th and 8th century. Um, People in Zamar have been trying to raise their concerns over the pollution and land impacts from mining for decades, um, but they haven't been able to get even basic information about mining license ownership, concession boundaries, or even water quality monitoring data, both around the quantity of water that's being used by mining companies, as well as the contamination or water quality information. And this is really despite significant open data progress in the country of Mongolia. Not only does the government have a very robust environmental data portal, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative or EITI provides detailed contract information and other civil society, private sector and institutional ins initiatives um, really provide open data about the extractive sector activities and policies. And of course, Basan and the people of Mongolia are not alone, right? I just wanna quickly mention that we all know pollution is a huge global environmental justice problem where data and information is really critically needed. And I'll just quickly note, the problem is rarely the absence of a regulatory framework addressing pollution or really the lack of data collection per se. So I think it's important that we really sort of unpack exactly what's going on. And that's really where the Stripe project comes in. Um, in partnership with a large coalition of civil society partners in the countries listed on the screen, Stripe really focuses on empowering local communities and civil society to use their right to information and participation to understand and engage in pollution decision making at both the local and national level. Now, each community that we worked with in the different countries focused on different pollution challenges. In Indonesia, we worked with local communities living along the Kujang River, um, where the river was being polluted from pulp and paper mill and textile industrial sources. In Thailand, it was people living near the Mataput industrial estate. In Morocco, it was people in Tangier concerned about the landfill um, and the new landfill that was going to be built. And then in Mongolia, Tunisia, and in Jamaica, it was working with a variety of different mining communities concerned about those impacts. Um, I want to take time to sort of drill down to some of the access information findings that were really based on summary of research that we conducted during the first three years of this project um, in Asia. Um, and you can see it's based on this report that is on the website um, if you're really looking for more information about what I'm going to be talking about moving forward. So um, the report investigated the sort of three key questions that are highlighted on my slide. It was basically based on a community survey data. We did an indicator-based research into the proactively disclosed environmental information that should be available to the public, as well as did a right to know um, access to information request submission exercise, where we submitted FOIA requests or freedom of information requests for governmental information. And we really made quite a number, I think, of important insights. 
The first really was that in all three countries, despite the focusing on different environmental problems, local community members had very similar information needs. They essentially all wanted local facility specific information about pollution issues in their own community. Synthesized national level data was often not enough to address their concerns. And this included the kind of examples you see on the screen, water quality monitoring, discharge permits, environmental impact assessments, enforcement and compliance documents, and public health information. Um, but the regulatory mechanisms for getting people this local data and information was really not working well. So first, it was quite clear from our research that all three of these countries had robust frameworks for releasing environmental information. They all had right to know laws and they all required the release of environmental information proactively or publicly. But you can see from this um, analysis that the local facility specific information like EIAs or informant monitoring reports was not the public information that was available. That's what is in purple on this chart versus what should be available, which is in yellow and purple. Similarly, um, for the freedom of information or right to know requests, you can see that local communities in Indonesia and in Mongolia didn't get the information that they wanted from those information requests that were submitted as well. And essentially poor implementation and the use of these disclosure mechanisms are not reaching local communities and it's really impeding access to information in practice. In short, there's simply a gap between what is the policy and the practice. Um, the data and information provided really is just not living up to the principles that you all subscribe to in your open data charter. So in addition to the sort of lack of data access, the implementation gaps compounded by many other challenges. Local community members, for the most part, had very poor understanding of their rights and how to engage effectively with the regulatory process. There was lack of internet connection access or the ability to even understand or use the national websites or online portables. There was challenges around cost and traveling to government offices, which is often what happened when they wanted to collect the requested information. They had real difficulty understanding the unprocessed technical information or the pollution control requirements that are required under the law. We also found that there was really significant capacity barriers to the government in government officials, especially at the local or regional agencies, not really understanding that communities had the right to the information and unable to really help them or actively resisting their ability to collect the information that they wanted. Now, I don't have time to go into all of the details, but essentially the justice part came in really how we could help local communities overcome these information barriers and build their capacity to really understand and use the information to advocate for their concerns. Um, we we really can sum, we summarized our approach and the work that we did in this toolkit that is also available on our website um, that really summarizes both the work that the partners led and the tools and strategies that they used to essentially translate the data to advocacy and the outcomes that they achieved. I just wanted to quickly go back to the gold mining sites in Zamar, just to provide you with one example, based on the information we were collected, our partners actually can create, can, created these concession maps that included both exploration and exploitation licenses. Um, they were able to use this and it really helped translate the information into a form that was meaningful to the local community members. Um, in fact, we were told by local activists that even the local government offices were using these maps that were created because they were better than the maps that were being provided by the national level government. So, the other key point that I want to really um, reinforce is that um, 
We worked with over 13 civil society partners in five countries and really provided support to hundreds of local communities. Um, but when you really take the time to build their commitment, their capacity, as much as it is a time consuming process, they are able to achieve um, sort of meaningful outcomes. And we were really able to pass additional regulations, engage in strong, ensure there was better oversight and enforcement. Um, actually, there was um, revoking of certain company licenses due to poor practices in Mongolia. We were able to strengthen the network and the engagement of civil society and local communities and even form um, new partnerships. So with all of these examples, it really is possible, but data does not magically translate into action. You really do need to perform to identify where the barriers are and where the support is really needed. And this is really my final sort of key takeaway, which is that it's really important for governments to really understand where local government, I mean, where local communities information needs lie. Are you tracking and synthesizing the information needs of local communities? Can you create a centralized system for synthesizing and proactively releasing the local facility specific environmental information that local people want? And can you provide categories of environmental documents and data on your data portals so that people can easily access the kind of water monitoring reports, public health assessments, facility specific discharge permits, EIAs, and compliance and enforcement reports that local communities really need. And also, can you think about how to expand the release of the information in forms that are accessible offline and more easily understood by local communities? Um, that might include translating things into different languages. It might mean putting copies in local offices. But there's a variety of strategies that can be used, um, radio and TV in some countries is a more effective means for reaching local people. Um, but essentially the key takeaway message is that um, if you want local communities to have the opportunity to engage in policy making, you need to take the time and energy to build their capacity and help them learn to not just access the data and information that they want, but use the information effectively within their advocacy. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you for bringing this perspective of the human side of, of data, right? Like all the things that are needed to take data into action. And now you've, this, you've mentioned things related to capacity, but also to increasing data literacy in local communities, but also holding local governments accountable about their roles um, as data suppliers and as providing uh, access to information um, to, to local communities. So um, thank you, um, Alvaro, thank you, Diane, and thank you, Elizabeth, for your presentations. We are a bit ahead of time, but um, I, I would like to give um, our audience some minutes just in case they have comments or questions. Um, I know that Paul is in the call. Uh, Paul Stone was our former um, uh, co-chair at the implementation working group and he has worked also in the judiciary branch in New Zealand and he has like a lot of, of learnings from his experience so um, whether Paul or if anyone has a question or, or something to reflect on these presentations um, we have 15 minutes for a short discussion. Caroline? Do you want to? Yes, yes, it's me. Let me just put the light on just a second so I can put the camera on, sorry. It was so interesting that I forget to put the light on. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, thank you for all the presentations. I'm particularly interested in Elizabeth's work um, because I'm trying to set up a project in Kenya in particular with farmers. And the idea really is how can people, I mean, how can you know what they need to begin with, which is what I really find, we tend to impose this, and with the best intention, right? Just, we have this 
yeah, the best intention to do things because we know the community and we, so I lived in Venezuela for many, many years. So it's very familiar to me, um, poverty and lack of resources. And so my question to you, Elizabeth, is how best do you, do you start this work? What's kind of the entry to those communities, to that work with them and not for them, which I think you really, um, at least I got it from your presentation and, and it's, it's amazing. And I'm really just in awe and wanting to learn from you to do it, you know, to do it well. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I will say that the toolkit that I referenced does sort of go through our process on a step-by-step -step basis. So that's a great resource for anybody and all of you who are really looking to sort of at least see what we did and, and learn more about the outcomes that we were able to achieve. It essentially, two key points that I would want to start with. The first is really, I cannot emphasize the enough of having a coalition of implementing partners on the ground. I'm in Washington, DC. There is just no way that both logistically as well as culturally, I am the right person to go into Mongolia or Indonesia and tell them what is the problem, what information they need, and what their concerns really are, right? So we really need to have those good networking partners that really work directly with local communities that have built the time and trust and relationship with them so that these local communities really see you as a partner and a supporter and not, as you were saying, somebody who comes in and imposes an idea on them. The second important part is really some form of community needs assessment. And the toolkit does go into sort of different options because because our partners did use slightly different approaches in each one of the countries. So that can be, but the key is really talking directly with local communities about what their experience is, about what their needs are, and what the problem is, and then spending the time to translate those concerns almost into like regulatory speak, right? So if they say, I'm really concerned that the fish are dying in the river that I rely on, then you need to be able to unpack, well, that means that you're concerned about the pollution that's being released by the companies, and that that means you need to know about water quality data, you need to know what they're required, um, to what they're allowed to release into the water, what they're not allowed to release in the water, and really take them through that step by step, and then help them actually access the water quality data or whatever the data is that they need that will actually answer that question. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, in any case, could I, if I, uh, I saw your email, is there any way I can contact you if I need any? Absolutely. I I'm happy to speak with you. Yeah. I'm, and I'll put it again in the chat. Just Thank you, forever. Ellie. That's very kind. Thank you so much. Thank you, Caroline, for your question. Um, we have another question in the in the chat. Um, it's by Giselle, and she's asking, um, how could we harmonize the top-down strategies? So the data standards um, that um, Diane was mentioning uh, with the sorry with bottom-up ones, so to hear local communities um, and their demands. So maybe I can give the floor to the three of us. We can start by Diane, just in, uh, in case you have like any comment on that, on how we can like um, define a strategy or define standards or set up uh, data interoperability across courts, but at the same time, like have this, um, demand from local communities approach, and then we can go to Alvaro and finally uh, with Elizabeth. So any comments? Yeah, thank you, Flora. I think it's, I think it's critically important to, to, to be working from, from both directions, as it were. Um, you know, when we started working on our data standards, we were involving um, people from the courts um, from all levels of courts uh, within state courts. But we took as, as one of our one of our bases, what kinds of data requests for courts 
receiving. So what are those, those local demands for data? What is it that people want to know? What is it that people need to know? And that very much informed, informed our process. Um, it's not just what you know we think theoretically from a national perspective people ought to be collecting, but what are the actual requests? What are the actual demands? And, and in particular looking at which ones, which ones cannot be met. And I'll give you one example. We get a lot of, of questions from, from um, um, individuals and from um, people interested in, in um, social justice issues, a lot of, a lot of requests for, for race and ethnicity data. Most courts do a terrible job of collecting that data. So really thinking about how those data could be collected and how they could be shared in ways that were meaningful and would lead to public policy improvements. And so that, you know, that's a matter of looking at what, what are people asking courts for that courts can't provide um, and try to provide some guidance and standards around those issues. Thank you, um, Diane. Alvaro, any thoughts? Yeah, I, no, I think it's, it's an excellent question. When I, when I mentioned that judiciaries are, are usually risk averse and, and you know, they, 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 they have resistances to this type of policies, one of the things they are not used to at all is to reaching out to the community and talking to the community and engaging the community, not only the users of the justice system, that is, are people that go to court and they're, you know, the legal professionals, but, they, you know, average citizens that have needs that they want to know things in, about the justice system, that they have access to justice problems. So one of the things that is not at all um, against or, you know, incompatible, sorry, my English is so rusty. The pandemics have killed my English, I'm sorry. But uh, um, having these for, forums to, to, to engage the community and bring judges and bring judicial officers and people in charge of statistics in the justice system and get them together with community actors, which is average citizens. Uh, it could be academics, it could be practitioners, people that reuse the, da the data published by the justice system. It's, it's a key part of these strategies because it gives, it creates a constituency out there that demands open data, you know? support open justice reforms. So I, I, I think that the, the Giselle's question is, is totally relevant. It's, it's, it's a great one. And she points out to the need to craft these platforms and these mechanisms that within in the justice systems, we're not used to them at all. And I speak for Argentina's or Latin American judiciaries in general. I'm not so that familiar with other regions. Thank you, Alvaro. Elizabeth, any thoughts? Um, two quick ones. The, the first, I think that the sort of explosion of open data has really changed the information management kind of infrastructure, but I still think there's really important gaps with harmonizing from the national all the way down to the local level. Regional or local government agencies are often the ones that have enforcement and compliance responsibilities. And so a lot of the information that local communities want is from those agencies. So how that information is being harmonized up, I think is really, really important to making sure that you're really meeting the needs of local people. And then I hate to say it because it sounds like such a cop out, but there really is this element of political will and the political economy, the incentives that are ensuring that the budget, the resources, the training are being put in place to really provide information to the public. Um, I often, when I talk with our civil society partners, their first reaction that they'll get is that, why do you want this information? Why do you need this data? Um, it's not um, a question of, we can't figure out how to get it to you. So I do think that we also need to just really, ex you know, embrace this idea that better information, better data within the hands of local people will make them better able to engage more effectively in decision making, which will ultimately allow for better environmental decision making in general. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, we have a hand raised by Pablo. Do you have any question? Thank you. Hi, Florencia. Hi, everyone. It's thanks to be here. 
Uh, I work with Alvaro in, in the judicial branch in the city of Buenos Aires. I, I'm one of the members of this bottom-up transparency uh, courts uh, that he mentioned. And I think uh, to just some reflection of what uh, Elizabeth just said and connecting it with something that Diana said as well, right? Like uh, at the end of the day, I think much of, of what we been discussing today is about political will, right? And, and, and seeing the data as a strategic asset. So it's, it's not only from, from my uh, opinion, not only to see it from the community, uh, social, society, also from within the system itself, the, the, the magistrate councils, the ministries of justice, seeing data uh, and, and building a narrative that it's uh, like it's fruitful for the people within the court system, letting people within the court systems know that if we use data properly as a strategic uh, asset, we're going to be able to get our, our, our work better every day, you know, and, and, and tackling lots of problems that with the rise of the pandemic got really worse, like uh, case backlogs in criminal uh, justice across the world. It's, it's it's tremendous how it it's rising. So sometimes this open data environment is has built a narrative that it's not that uh, you know it's it's not being sold well for me. I'm sorry also for for the rough series, but I'm trying to to build the concept of how do we convince people within the justice system. At the end of the day, you can have. Uh, the available uh, regulation, as Elizabeth said, you can have all the frameworks in place, but what's there uh, in reality, right? So I think this that Diana pointed out about thinking of data as, as strategic asset, it's key. Thank you, Pablo. Um, Paul is uh, also wanting to, to make a comment. Um, he, he has been implementing and, and, and trying to reform um, the justice sector in New Zealand. So thank you, uh, Paul. Hi. Um, yeah, so first of all, um, really appreciate your English. Thank you very much, because my uh, Spanish or any other language is absolutely uh, non-existent. So thank you. Um, and yeah, I haven't, haven't managed to reform much in the uh, justice system while I was there, but I can tell a good news story about over time, um, the opening of disaggregated statistics about the justice system has made the New Zealand government cross the board a lot more uh, attentive to uh, the experience of our indigenous people, Maori people, um, and in particular uh, in our prisons. So the Maori population is about 8% of the national population now, and yet they're over 50% of the population in our prisons, which just shocked everybody, really, I think. Um, and so we've seen a culture change. Uh, all government agencies, and particularly in the justice sector, are uh, actively trying to lift people's capability around or knowledge of history in New Zealand um, from the Māori perspective um, and embracing te ao Māori culture into our workplace to be much more aware and to be able to relate and to be able to address the problems with a different perspective. Um, so that's really good news. There is a trap, though, um, that once you've got the open data there, we have a responsibility to, um, to tell the story well, um, because the same data, if, if I may, I'll just share a poster on screen. Oh, if the host can enable me, please. Yeah. Okay. You are right. a host now. Sorry? You are a host now. Ah, okay. So this poster I created um, just to help people understand. I've replaced ethnicities with uh, Game of Thrones ethnicities just to uh, mask the reality. But it shows how the same data, the, the actual lines in the graph are a real um, graph of the youth justice outcomes for the last 10 years. 
And uh, this, the example on the right was what was reported in a, um, an annual report um, that was published. So in other words, it was saying, you know, this, well, and the reality was the Maori people are still 5.8 times more uh, convictions on our young people. Whereas they totally overlooked the fact that over 10 years, we've seen a 70% drop. Um, so I was trying to help uh, people understand uh, that this is why the Maori people are continually complaining about deficit reporting in our media is because all they get is the bad news. And that's affecting the morale of people that aren't even in the justice system. You know, they, they've done nothing wrong, but they feel bad simply because they're Maori. Um, and so there needs to be more focus on telling the good story, not the bad story in the data. So I just thought I would uh, share that with you. No, I'm just trying to unshare it. Thank you, Paul. Um, so we are two minutes late, so we have to wrap up. Um, but just one last um, comment that I, that I want to ask the panel just to close. Um, so we've been talking about that these reforms require political will, right? We talk about um, politics or people we need to convince uh, in order to open up more good quality data or make it interoperable across platforms and, and databases. Um, in one sentence, and I'm asking the three of you, how can you convince a politician that this agenda is important? And maybe we can stop recording if you want to give like a, a right answer. <laughs> To be a little bit cynical, I will say that I always think about what's in it for them. How does it benefit them to make the data more accessible? Um, and so sometimes that means making different arguments with different people. Um, but but um, I will. One thing that I tell judges is, if you refuse to release information, people will assume the worst. Thanks, Diane. I I have one suggestion. I mean. Um, when I mentioned that you need a strategy for promoting this type of reforms, one of the key issues is precisely that, for instance, to find issues that are attractive to politicians. So I would say, for example, right now, climate change, COVID, and you know, uh, procurement, you know, that those are key issues. And also in Latin America, gender, the gender agenda is at, at the top of the political agenda. So we, if we use those topics to not only to, to construct an open data agenda and to you know, generate political capital for, for, the, uh, for these reforms, but also to support these agendas that are extremely important, like Paul mentioned, for example, prisons and, you know, uh, and, and, and other issues that happen all around the world. I mean, if we find those key uh, topics, it will help us to make a case for the importance of, of this type of, of reforms. Thank you, Alvaro. Elizabeth? I think you get, I don't mean to be, well, I do mean to be melodramatic if I'm talking to a politician, but I think you get lack of trust, you get protests, you get lawsuits, you get violence, you get a breakdown of relationships between local people and government if you do not provide them with the information and the confidence that they need in the decisions that you're making. Access to information is the foundation for participation and accountability. And I think that it will make their job better and they will achieve more efficient and effective outcomes if they can expand and include the voice and the concerns of more people than the powerful in their decision-making. Thank you so much uh, for the three of you. This has been an amazing call. Uh, I would like to thank you for your insights and, and your advice. Um, just before we wrap up, I would like to um, 
mentioned that we are still looking for um, um, co-chair at the implementation working group. So we, we usually have one representative from um, civil society and one representative for government. Our call for um, the co-chair in government is, is open. So please uh, feel free to reach me or reach any of the ODC team, uh, just in case you have questions or, or something. Um, having said that, thank you so much again. Uh, we are really happy um, to have you and see you next month. Thank you so much. Gracias. See you everyone next month. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the speaker. Bye. Bye.